So I'm, I'm very happy to share uh, this afternoon's uh, panel, which is actually the last panel of our wonderful conference. Uh, we are, so this panel is entitled Politics of Grievability, I'm, I'm sure. I'm absolutely certain it will bring bells and, and uh, create a, another series of connections with, with everything with, uh, which we've uh, listened to uh, and heard so far. So first of all, we're going to listen to uh, Sonia Lutz, who is a senior lecturer in the Afrikaans and Netherlands section of the School of Languages at the University of Cape Town. She is a co-editor of an anthology of uh, short fiction. She's also herself a novelist, and her novel, um, I forgot that. Circus Bulls. Circus Bulls. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> I'm sorry. Was awarded, well, no, many prizes. Yeah. <laughs> was awarded the Mnet Prize for Africa Memorial Award. Um, and and uh, uh, she uh, obtained her PhD uh, with a thesis on encyclopedic fiction and the over of South African novelist Marlene van Nieker. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My paper will focus today on the deaths and afterlives of two migrant tribal chiefs from the 19th century, the Lakota chief, Sitting Bull, and the Nama chief, Hendrik Witboy. Both were border crossing figures, both forced to abandon their traditional homelands. Sorry. Uh, both killed when they rebelled against colonizers and denied a proper burial. My analysis is situated in the shadowlands of Derrida's ontology. Through Derrida, I will argue that the ghosts of Sitting Bull and Hendrik Witboy and the spirit of their resistance against what the West foisted on them in the name of capitalism and democracy are still on the move. Sitting Bull needs little introduction. During his lifetime, the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty, duly signed on the occasion pictured here, granted the Black Hills of South Dakota to the Sioux tribes. When white settlers crossed the borders to prospect for gold, war broke out. Sitting Bull led his tribe north across the border to Canada, but faced with mass starvation, they returned four years later. While being held captive at the Standing Rock Reservation in South Dakota, he clashed with authorities from the Office of Indian Affairs, represented by agent James McLaughlin. In 1890, the spiritual revival movement known as the Ghost Dance gave fleeting hope to Plains Indians who believed that songs and ceremonies could bring back their dead and ensure the restoration of their lands. McLaughlin sent Indian police to arrest Sitting Bull at his small cabin. When Sitting Bull resisted the arrest, he was shot dead. 12 other men were killed in the ensuing gunfight. Six of them Indian police officers and six of them Sitting Bull's compatriots, so-called hostile Indians. The Indian policemen were buried with full military honors and this photo was taken of the ceremony. Soon after, a pillar was erected, inscribed with their names and the following words. These men were killed in battle with hostile Indians while arresting Chief Sitting Bull. 43 policemen were opposed by 160 armed fanatical ghost dancers. In stark contrast, the hostiles were buried in unmarked graves. At Fort Yates, the army surgeon responsible for the post-mortem on Sitting Bull's corpse stole a pair of leggings from the corpse and cut a lock of hair from Sitting Bull's head. These were held for many decades by the Smithsonian Museum. Only when he was done, Sitting Bull's body was buried without ceremony in a far corner of the reserve. Two weeks later, the army brutally suppressed the ghost dance movement by attacking a group of Lakota 
at Wounded Knee. The dead were collected by wagon and then buried in a mass grave. Photographers accompanied the burial party. The photographs sold well and carried the story of the massacre at Wounded Knee worldwide. We had better, in order to protect our civilization, wipe these untamed and untamable creatures from the earth, wrote South Dakota newspaper man, Al Frank Baum, the future author of The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, in an editorial at the time. Let's turn our attention for the moment to Hendrik Witboy, born one year earlier than Sitting Bull in what is today known as South Africa. After succeeding his father as captain, he led the Witboy Nama north to Southwest Africa, which was annexed as a colony in, by, by Germany in the 1880s. Members of the Herero tribe sub were subjected to violence, rape, and murder. The Nama did not escape unharmed. This is a German postcard of Nama captives being executed while German women and children look on. The Herero rebelled in 1904 and Lothar von Trauta issued his notorious extermination order. Horrified by the treatment of his erstwhile enemies, the Herero, Witboy declared war and the smaller Nama tribe joined the uprising. This led to von Trotta's notorious proclamation in 1905. The mighty and powerful German emperor will grant mercy to the Hottentot people and will spare the lives of those who surrender. Those few who do not submit will suffer the same fate as the Herreros, who in their blindness believed that they could carry on successful war with the mighty German emperor. I ask you, where are all the Herreros today? Where are their chiefs? The Herrera people have been annihilated and the Hottentots will suffer the same fate if they do not surrender and give up their weapons. Witboy was killed later that year on the battlefield. Fearing mutilation by his enemies, he was buried in a secret forgotten grave near Falgras, which has never been rediscovered. What followed was the first genocide of the 20th century. By 1908, the German colonial government had killed 80% of the Herrera and 50% of the Nama populations. Survivors were captured and deported to concentration camps. One of the most notorious of these was Shark Island. Here, Eugene Fisher, later a prominent Nazi scientist, conducted experiments on both the living the barely living and the dead. Female Nama prisoners were forced to boil heads of dead inmates and scrape remains of their skin and eyes with shards of glass. An estimated 300 skulls were sent from these concentration camps to Germany. The dead were buried in shallow, unmarked graves. They are still there. We had better wipe these creatures from the earth, wrote Frank Baum after Wounded Knee. The Herrera people wipe, the Herrera people have been annihilated and the Hottentots will suffer the same fate, wrote Francois von Trotter. These apocalyptic pronouncements assume definitive endpoints and the exorcism of ghosts, specters and spectrality, but one is never freed so easily from ghosts whose apparitions are all the fuller as one undertakes to reject or deny them, writes Pierre Machery in his analysis of Derrida. How do these ghosts make themselves known? We'll start with the graves and with those who say they are speaking for the dead. In Wounded Knee, McLaughlin had made it clear how the authorities wished the death of Sitting Bull to be remembered. The victors separated from the vanquished, a version of history sanctioned by the union of church, state and army. But from the turn of the century, they were those who questioned the status quo. 
A missionary, Mary Collins, erected a small monument in memory of Sitting Bull and his friends where they were killed. She also managed to get this, um, the site where the hostiles were buried officially recognized as a cemetery. In 1915, under pressure of a local newspaper, Sitting Bull's grave was repaired and a new stone steel added. But they, when there was talk of relocating the body, Eugene Mossman, a successor of McLaughlin, declared, I recommend that Sitting Bull's dust remain where it is and where it should be in a lonely grave in plain view of the government school, the agency buildings and the churches, all of which he fought. Mossman had a concrete slab brought over the grave and erected a new sign presenting Sitting Bull simply as medicine man, not a warrior or a leader. But more and more, his attitude seemed anachronistic. Photos of visitors to the, to the grave testified to a new demonstration of reverence and atonement with gazes directed toward the grave and hats in hand. In 1953, a group of businessmen with the approval of relatives of Sitting Bull exhumed the remains <coughs> under cover of night and snuck the casket across the border to the South Dakota site of the Standing Rock Reservation. As the sun rose, they buried Sitting Bull near the town of Mowbridge. Soon after, they erected a memorial. But much was still unresolved. The Lakotas say that in 1986, many of them started dreaming about Sitting Bull. They discussed this amongst themselves and decided to institute an annual memorial rite in his honor. One of them explains, the rite was important because the Lakota usually do a wiping of the tears ceremony after a loss. But after Wounded Knee, we were a broken people. We were too damaged to do the wiping of the tears after a year. And really we remained in mourning for those people who died for a hundred years. The memorial rite happens annually and yet the trauma associated with the unritual has not been resolved and the unritualized specter still haunts the living. We have plans for the future of my great grandfather, says Ernie Lapointe in his Sitting Bull memoir. This is reminiscent of Derrida's insight inspired by Hamlet that ghosts dislocate time so that time is out of joint. Last year, DNA tests proved conclusively that Ernie is the great grandson of Sitting Bull as he has maintained all along. A DNA sample for Sitting Bull was obtained from the lock of hair which was returned by the Smithsonian to Ernie. My main goal is to be the voice of my great grandfather, he says. There are others who also say they speak for Sitting Bull and the Wounded Knee Dead. Those include legislators and activists calling on President Joe Biden to revoke the medals awarded to soldiers who participated in the killings at Wounded Knee. And we are Sitting Bull's people, said protesters in 2016, when they demonstrated against the Dakota crude oil access pipeline close to Wounded Knee. At the moment, the Lakota are staring down yet another encroachment on their historic lands, a 10,600 acre uranium mine proposed to be built in the Black Hills. According to Jamison Derrida, when he writes about ghosts, is less interested in the hold of the past on the present than in what spectrality holds for the future and in the apparition of the past in the act of provoking future action. The descendants of Sitting Bull point to the difficulties democratic free market economies are experiencing, including environmental degradation. And they ask questions about what this implies for the future. Here is Ruth Hopkins, a Lakota writer and lawyer. The greatest mistake the colonizers made was leaving even just one of us alive because we are still ghost dancing. 
I remember those slaughtered at Windet Knee, and I keep sitting bull's visions of hope alive. Our planet calls upon us now to cease the death and destruction wrought by an evil, unsustainable system of greed that promises to destroy all life on Mother Earth. And back to Hendrik Witboy. Southwest Africa remained a German colony until it was made a League of Nations mandate of the Union of South Africa after World War I. When the mandate was terminated, South Africa remained illegally occupying the territory. During this time, Witboy was vilified in many Afrikaans novels as a cunning, cruel warlord and the fanatical, deluded enemy of white boers. Witboy kept a diary in Dutch which has survived and has been entered into the UNESCO memory of the World Register, but he is presented as illiterate and savage in these novels. They read like variations on Gustav Frensen's notorious um, novel Peter Moore's Fart nach Südwest, fiction arguing for the right to take the land away from Africans and to put it to use for European settlement. On the other hand, during Namibia's liberation struggle, Witboy was an icon for plan the People's Liberation Army of Namibia. When Namibia became independent in 1990, Witboy's face was chosen to decorate the new banknotes. And President Sam Joma declared, we, the new generation of the land of the brave, are inspired by Captain Hendrik Witboy's revolutionary action in combat against the German imperialists. In Namibia, Hendrik Witboy is still a principal reference point for identity construction. The date when he was killed in action is commemorated annually. It involves a symbolic reenactment of important events in his life using up to 80 horse riders. For formal occasions, Nama traditional authorities still wear the traditional white headgear for which the tribe was named. Witboy remembrance policy is geared explicitly towards emphasizing unattained communal ends, above all control of ancestral lands. It also involves referencing the colonial genocide and pursuing demand, demands for reparation. In 2018, 90 Herero and Nama skulls were returned by the German government to, to Namibia. Hendrik Witboy's Bible and his whip were also returned. Last year, Germany finally recognized uh, committing genocide during, the, during its colonial occupation of Namibia and announced financial aid worth more than a billion euros. However, the interconnected issues around honoring Witboy, the colonial genocide and the German reparations remain inconclusive and unresolved. So for instance, colonial monuments in Namibia still represent uneven resources. Compare the statue in Windhoek of a German Schutztruppe soldier and the monument to Hendrik Witboy in his traditional stronghold, Gibeon. That's Gibeon. In South Africa, as in Namibia, Witboy has become a rallying point for a redefined identity articulated by, amongst others, Simon Witboy, a direct descendant. <clears throat> Known as the rap singer Himmelbiesem, he has a large tattoo of his ancestor on the inside of his forearm. In his autobiography, God Speaks Afrikaans, he writes that he placed it there so that when he performs, Hendrik Witboy will be close to the microphone and will be able to speak through him. I will end with a short clip of a song called Witboy by Himmelbiesem. Himmelbiesem's song is part of a more widespread re-evaluation of Witboy in South Africa, Namibia, and the Netherlands. In... Uh, I'm searching for Hendrik Witboy by Piet van Rooyen. That's the, that would be the English title. And I am Hendrik Witboy by Connie Brahm. He is portrayed as a visionary political leader. Uh, the Emperor's Eagle over Namaland, Into the Distance, and We Are the Avengers um, all explore threats of shared ideology between the Herero and Nama genocide and the Nazi Holocaust. 
with reference to Hendrik Witboy and his descendants. To conclude, Sitting Bull has two graves, but it is possible that his bones are in either. Witboy's grave was never found, and, is, and he is also honored with two empty graves, one in the Heroes Eiker in Windhoek and one in Gibeon. These men are nowhere and yet they are everywhere. Frederick Jameson under a heading, The Return of the Repressed, writes that Derrida's ghosts occasion moments in which the present and above all our current present, the wealthy, sunny, gleaming world of the postmodern and the end of history of the new world system of light capitalism unexpectedly betrays us. The descendants of Sitting Bull and Hendrik Witboy are from tribes that were meant to be exterminated, but they are still there. They are still here. They are questioning the wealthy, sunny, gleaming American and European worlds of the present. From Gibeon to Namib in Namibia to Wounded Knee in North Dakota, the ongoing conversation between Sitting Bull and his descendants and Hendrik Witboy and his descendants are geared toward the future and focused on reclamation and restitution. This illustrates Derrida's point that learning to live more justly can only maintain itself with some ghost, can only talk with or about some ghost, and that this being with specters is a politics of memory, of inheritance, and of generations. Um, I wanted to play a one minute clip. I'm not sure that I can get there. <laughs> Are you awake to see? So to save, uh, to save time, I'm just picking up the song in the middle of all of it so that we can get to the chorus and then I will leave. Yes. Yes. In a bullet of man, Ali, who the most of the land, Ali, the second of the land, the deep and unbelievable company in a girl focuses on cultural pluralism and religious minorities from cross-cultural perspectives. Her areas of specialization include funerary, funerary <laughs> rituals in the context of migration, <clears throat> and particularly the funerary rituals sorry, of Muslim minorities in France and Britain. Thank you, thank you very much. We've been talking during those uh, two intensive and very interesting days on death uh, and migration, particularly on a micro scale. My talk echoes many of the talks uh, that we've heard, but more particularly that of Maurice about grief and protest. But I offer a different perspective, both in time and uh, place, but also a very different scale. Because the event I'm going to present uh, now took place 19 years ago in Normandy, France in 2003. These deaths did not take place on the other side of the globe, nor in the deep blue sea. Instead, they happened on the River Seine, this lovely romantic river was the stage of a drama where three men drowned 
a few kilometers from where uh, the river flows to the sea. My main interest here is to focus on how these events were constructed and highlight the power and control the officials have over migrant bodies, whether dead or alive. I would also like to emphasize the role of undocumented migrant activism that made the difference at that moment for the three dead migrants. Uh, my talk will be thus structured around three main points. I will first outline the chronology of the events and the way they were reported on in the press. Then I will dwell on the central role played by Qadir, Kader, and this is for you, Yum. Qadir is <laughs> Qadir is a fascinating character. He was a former undocumented migrant, and he prayed and he played a key role in unveiling the presence of the corpse in the morgue. As I told you, he's a fascinating character, and if the topic of this conference was to be personified, it would be him. Kader it was, is, was an Algerian. He had escaped death on many occasions before reaching Europe and who had occupied for several years a job at Le Havre's morgue. He has today the French nationality and is an employee of the city in charge of the cemeteries. In the last part of my talk, I will underline that no matter the scale or the geographical location, the dead bodies are, as we put it in French, la patate chaude, the hot potato, uh, the buck that is passed from one side to the other. The scale is of no importance, whether death takes place in the Mediterranean Sea, across the Channel, or in the River Seine, it is always a ping pong game between the different protagonists to deal with the corpse. Inquiring about what happened 20 years ago was time and energy consuming. Moreover, I was taken aback by the deep emotion that surfaced in the interviews, even though the tragic event took place a long time ago. The chronology of this case in the media coverage was sketchy and sometimes contradictory. The fact that I'm going to narrate, the fact that I'm going to narrate our reconstitution of media coverage local and national, but more particularly, they are based on the interviews I conducted with the local activists and the city officials. At first, the early stages of this story can seem common in a port area. On Monday, 29th of September, 2003, three young men were arrested by the police, local police in Port Jérôme, Notre Dame de Gravenchon. So I'm going to say Port Jérôme in, instead of saying the, the very long name of, uh, of this uh, town. So Port Jérôme is an inland port on the river Seine, 30 kilometers away from Le Havre. The three young men were found walking along the river. Their clothes were soaked and they visibly suffered from hypothermia. They declared to the police that they were four to have jumped from the boat. The police went searching for the fourth man. He would be arrested a few hours later at a bus stop, soaked and shivering in the cold night. The four young men had obviously spent some time in the river. They were taken to the hospital by the local police forces. Then they were handed immediately to the PAF, la police of frontières, uh, the border police and immigration officers. The story could have ended here. But the next day, on Tuesday, 13th of September, an unanimated body was found on the border of the river at Kielbeuf. The tribunal following the discovery of the dead body initiated an investigation. The rumor ran very quickly that there have been more than five undocumented migrants on boards of the Baltic Captain One. It is the name of the ship that had moored on the river port. It had sailed, in fact, uh, the Baltic Captain One had sailed 13 days ago from Conakry, Ghana. 
And according to the captain and crew, the presence of the stowaways went unnoticed on board. In the early press articles, the, the, the Guineans, because they were Guineans, uh, they were referred to in the local press first as Africans or the Africans. And then after the body was found, their national origins was mentioned in the press. The news was published on the front page of the local newspaper, Le Havre Presse. The interrogation of the four survivors revealed that they were seven on board the ship. And this was leaked immediately to the press. And as you could see, it appeared on the front line. Yet the Prefet of the Seine-Maritime dismissed immediately and publicly uh, the possibility of the presence of other illegal migrants on board and uh, described it as unfounded rumors. He ordered the halt of police searches for the potential other migrants, uh, despite this growing rumor of the presence of others. These rumors were relayed in the national press alluding to potential other victims. It first appeared as a news brief in Le Monde, then in Libération, then more extended articles, and uh, then it spread in the Telegraph, in Bain Minute, etc. Four days later, a second corpse was found at Kilbeuf on the 6th of October. On the 9th of October, the third dead body was found floating on the river. So we have here three dead bodies that were found in less than nine days. The press reported on these successive macabre discovery as if it was a bad thriller. Were they five, if you could read, then uh, the next day, maybe seven, and then uh, in another press, unexpected ground bodies. So an issuing mobilization took place in Le Havre, even though the events did not take place in the city sport. It was initiated by a group of undocumented migrants who had created a working collective named Le Collectif des Sans Papiers in 2002, a year earlier. Two other local associations, ASSE and ACETI, participated in, in their fight for legal residence, residency rights. They were very active and visible in the city. In fact, they embraced the cause of the seven Guineans and even struggled to provide help to the four survivors. They were quickly outraged by what they described as a shoddy and rushed investigation in which the captain was not held responsible and was cleared from any unlawful conduct. Two out of the four Gideons who survived the incident were underage. They were 13 years and 15 years old and could have easily been eligible to minor migrant protection. In spite of much effort, the associations were unable to get in contact neither with the uh, survivors nor with the uh, court appointed lawyer. The migrants were very quickly transferred from the hospital to the court and from the court to a detention center and the next step was the airport. The shipment company contributed in the expenses of their flight back to Guinea. 20 days later, on the 21st of October, the Sans Papier Association organized a posthumous tribute, an event combining commemoration and protest at the same time at Port Jerome in the memory of the three drowned young men. It was clear in the mind of everyone present that day that the three bodies had been repatriated to Guinea. More than 250 people attended the ceremony that was organized. Most of the demonstrators were former, former or undocumented migrants. Some of them were regularized the same year. Candles were lit and placed in water so they floated away. A sense of total frustration and impotence was predominant because none of the associations were able, as I told you, to get in touch with the, with the four. 
that had managed to survive, but were nonetheless deported, even though they had reached France alive. The gathering was an intense emotional moment. They were mourning not only the loss of the three, but also, and mainly I would say, the failed attempt of the four others to stay in France. One element was repeated by all the interviewees. We did not even get to know their names, not the names of the dead migrants, nor those of the survivors. It is as if they had never existed. In fact, since the tragic discovery of the three uh, bodies, the collective, de, le, le, pardon, le collectif de sans papier, uh, in an attempt to catch the public eye and the press, organized several marches in the city of Le Havre. The marches were reported in the local newspapers and many articles were published. You have two of them here. And the, the article were voicing the demands of the sans papier and their numerous unanswered questions concerning the deportation and the death of the Guineans. So you could see that the two subjects were always presented as being part of the same uh, issue, the, uh, the fight for legal documents and on the other side, uh, more light on the death of those three Guineans. And here we come back to Qadir, to Kader. One of the demonstrators who marched with the sans papier was Kader. As I mentioned earlier, he was a, uh, uh, an undocumented migrant who had obtained a legal status the same year. He started his first declared work contract and he had loads of jobs, but none of them were declared. This was his first one. He was so happy about it. In Le, Morgue, in Le Havre, in the morgue in September, 2004. This is where he discovered in the morgue, three drawers containing three unidentified bodies. They were young and they were black. So one year later, the migrants' dead bodies were still laying in the house morgue. The contrast between the hasty repatriation of the living and the oblivion of the dead bodies was striking. Judging from the interviews that I conducted with both Kader and the other activists, this discovery came as a double shock. They were grief stricken twice, recalling the commemoration they had organized one year ago for bodies they genuinely thought were already buried in their country of origin, while in fact they were lying in Le Havre's morgue. In reaction, the association organized a new gathering on the annual anniversary on the 29th of September 2004, outside this time the building of court authorities. The revelation in the press of the presence of the corpse in the morgue embarrassed the political authorities, uh, specifically in Le Havre, because the city of Le Havre was already in an intense fight with the Collectif des Sans-Papiers on other issues. But according to the French funerary law, the town where an unidentified body is found is legally obliged to cover for the expenses of his burial in its own cemetery. So the city of Le Havre had no obligation whatsoever to bury the dead ones because they died in Quilbeuf and Notre Dame de Gravenchon. And it is in fact important at this stage to show you where the dead bodies were found. So the first two were legally considered deceased on Kilbeuf, and the third one was officially considered deceased in Port Jérôme, Notre Dame de Gravenchon. Uh, two small towns on the side on the two sides of the River Seine. Uh, and as you can see, both had a political, a right wing political majority. So things could not be uh, uh, analyzed in terms of right wing or left wing uh, authorities. Uh, <clears throat> I tried to investigate, in fact, the official document. And again, here, this is what Francoise was saying. It was, it's not always easy to get access to the official documents. And I was officially denied access to the letter exchanged between the police, the morgue, and the two cities. Yet one senior clerk in Port Jérôme, who was in charge back in 2003, accepted anonymously to read out loud 
all the documents and the minutes of the investigation and the exchange letters between the different administrations. So in the light of these reading, there is no doubt that in the immediate aftermath of the tragedy and after the police inquiry case was closed, both cities were unwilling to bury the bodies in their cemetery. Letters were sent from both cities. Letter was sent first to the Guinean consulate to ask for money to pay for the repatriation expenses. Uh, one of the arguments put forward in the, in the letter that was read by the mayor is we would not want to deprive their family of this crucial moment of bereavement and grief. So that's why we ask you to participate in the repatriation of the bodies. The Kenyan consulate did not respond. Uh, and the bodies remained forgotten in the morgue. Yet, when this was revealed in the press, yes, when this was revealed in the press of Port Jerome, uh, Port Jerome decided, accepted, to welcome the body found on its ter territory. He was uh, buried in what is called the temporary allotment, Le Caveau Autonome. Uh, each cemetery has one or several ones. Uh, it is, I call it the transit zone. It's a place where you put the body while waiting for a definite, for, for a more permanent uh, spot. Meanwhile, <clears throat> on the other side of the River Seine, the mayor of Kilbeuf, who is senator also, by the way, maintained his refusal of burying the bodies. And this time in the letter, he was pretexting uh, another aspect. And it is out of respect that he could not take those uh, Guinean in his cemetery because, and I quote, how can we allow ourselves to bury them among Christians if we discover that they are finally Muslims? So, and in another letter, he also refused to take them in the cemetery because he would have to pay for the 20 months spent at the morgue because it costs money, every day it costs money. Finally, in June 25, the city uh, of Port Jerome decided to bury the two other Guineans in the city cemetery. The press was called, <clears throat> was present, and the body of the first migrant was removed from the temporary spot and the three men were buried together in the same burial spot. And what is surprising is that the city renewed in 2020 the concession rights for another 15 years and paid also for the maintenance of the grave. Even though the migrant's body who was buried in Port Jerome has always been reported in the official document as Mr. X or illegal immigrant from Guinea, or the African corpse, a name was given to him on the tombstone, <clears throat> Momo Kamara, but not to his two friends. These inscription on the tombstone reinforces the absurdity of, their, of his death and of their collective death. It, in an attempt to normalize their presence in the cemetery's deathscape. I searched for their names, in fact, in the available data on missing migrants. And uh, the death of three young men is listed in the migrant files as anonymous. They are absent from both the United List of Refugee Death and uh, from Mael Gallison's database that lists migrant death from 1999 to 2021. Um, I also found in a, in a collection, in a book, in a novel published by Didier Danang, who is a detective, uh, who writes, who's an author of detective novels, uh, one page of news brief concerning the death of those undocumented migrants. Uh, and I'm going to conclude, and it's not a conclusion, I'm gonna just uh, say this small sentence, uh, in order to stress the importance, in fact, um, the importance of the role played by the associations of Sans Papier, uh, the active presence and the active mobilizations of those who did not die, of those who made it, in fact. And I think in this specific context of Le Havre, this is really what made the difference 
uh, in finding a final resting place for Mumu and his friends. Thank you. I mean, I, I want to keep in mind the expression uh, la patachou, <laughs> how the material body is remains a, both at the, at the same time a taboo and um, really, you know, well, we don't want to deal with it. We don't want to deal with it. So uh, now we're going to listen to Henriette Cortal Fentes, who is the uh, assistant lecturer at Burbank College, University of London and is a specialist in 20th and 21st French literature. So that's another perspective on our course. So, um... Yes, so um, first of all, yes, thank you very much for having me here. Um, I, I obviously, um, as Marianne said, I'm coming from the perspective of French literature and French theory, and I've worked on mourning, so that's going to be my, my take um, on, on, on the topic today. I would like to also uh, warmly thank all the panels we've got, because I learned a lot, obviously, <laughs> and um, uh, I have to say that a lot of uh, questions have come up and there are now many more question marks in my talk. Mm -hmm. And um, also starting with the title itself, which I'm going to, you know, question mark, is it, is Ai Weiwei um, talking for the dead or not? That's going to be the, the topic of my talk today. So, um, yeah. So um, what is, now known and constructed as the migrant crisis, only garnered public awareness in 2015 when the Syrian civil war caused a massive exodus and suddenly attracted wide journalistic coverage. What had been a long existing phenomenon and had simply escaped the public eye, whether willfully ignored or condoned, suddenly came into being in the media in the form of what are now stock images, long lines of fleeing migrants, hordes waiting by rail tracks, the ubiquitous makeshift camps littered with plastic, the transient but perhaps real community of the Calais jungle, the barbed wires of borders and surveillance cameras, or the Mediterranean no longer a motherly mare nostrum, but an aquatic grave. All images that stripped migrants of their status of exile or asylum seeker. And um, so one of image, of course, we have to, when, talked about a, a lot is the body of the Syrian toddler, Alan Kurdi, washed ashore on the coast of Turkey. It crystallized all sorts of sentiment, emotion and affect, spoken or unspoken, from indignation to sympathy, shame and helplessness, which was perhaps best captured by the sand sculpture um, of the image of Alan Kurdi's body by Indian artist Sudarza, Sudarzan Paitnak. As a transient art form, it spoke about the transients of life, lives engulfed in the sea, but also of the very transients of the memory we bear of them. The words that accompanied it, accompanied it humanity washed ashore, shame, 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 speak volumes, all that or by, or by it obliquely about human responsibility and perhaps its limits, the shame at being helpless in front of a, of a moral disaster and the failure of international help, help. My aim in this paper is to look at representations of those who lost their lives during their flight, in, particularly, in particular in Ai Weiwei's much discussed documentary film, Human Flow. It indeed offers a comprehensive gaze of the migration crisis as Ai Weiwei's productions team traveled across 20 feet countries, interviewed six, about 600 refugees, humanitarian workers, aid workers, and policymakers alike. 
My aim here is to read the film against Judith Butler's analysis of what makes a life grievable or not, as formulated in her groundbreaking work, Precarious Life, The Powers of Mourning, and her follow-up essay, Frames of War, When is Life Grievable? In Frames of War, Judith Butler famously posited a divide between the lives that are individualized and mourned and those lives which are not, grieve, um, which are not um, grieved or grievable simply because they do not qualify as life, as lives. Such divide has defined the ways in which the Western policymakers have failed or succeeded in handing out humanitarian aid in situations of otherwise equal emergency. It is worth reminding that when is life breathable forms a follow-up to precarious life, the powers of warning, which exposed the politics of violence led by the Bush administration in the aftermath Math of 9-11 and construed it as an inability to mourn the deaths of, <coughs> of, uh, of the 9-11 victims and therefore it was a form of pathological mourning as well as a helplessness, a form of melancholy gone awry. <coughs> Criticism, in particular Ida Danavid, has argued that Judith Butler's foregrounding of grief vulnerability and compassion as the bedrock for new forms of cosmopolitanism problematically maintains a post-colonial status quo in which the West reasserts a moral superiority and only pays lip service to an ethics of care it otherwise promotes. Likewise, if human flow has been critically acclaimed in the mainstream press as a documentary that shows the harrowing plight of 65 million migrants and the inconceivable extent of the crisis. Academic criticism, however, has been quick to criticize the film for having given an individual voice mostly to policy makers and humanitarian workers rather than the refugees themselves and thus maintaining Ai Weiwei's status as a celebrity artist. My aim in this paper will to examine hand in hand the criticisms addressed to Judith Butler and Ai Weiwei, as both are about a status quo that would maintain a supposed moral, ontological and existential superiority of the Western world or the globalized North on the one hand and an artist over the refugees whose lives and deaths he documents on the other. My argument will seek to highlight how such criticisms are based on a number of what I see as misreadings of both Butler's and Ai Weiwei's works. I will show how the divide between the refugees and the onlooker, whether a humanitarian helper, activist, artist or academic like ourselves, remains an unsolvable conundrum. In the hope to overcome that impasse, I will take a step sideways and ask what we as onlookers are mourning and grieving when we are confronted with the images of the lives and deaths of refugees. So I would like to preface my talk with a few prefatory remarks about Judith Butler's essays, Frames of War, When is Life Grievable? She sets out her essay with the observation that some lives count as lives and are individuated and therefore mourned when lost, whether others are not. If certain lives, sorry, um, so I'm reading her here, I'm quoting her here. If certain lives do not qualify as lives or are from, from the start, not conceivable as lives within certain epistemological frames, then these lives are never lived nor lost in the full sense. This then begs the question as to what a life is, or in other terms, when is a life recognized as such? To answer the question, she posits that grievability is a presupposition for a life that matters existentially and politically. And so she continues to explain that without grievability, there is no life, or rather, there is something living that is other than life, 
Instead, there is a life that will never have been lived, sustained by no regard, no testimony, and ungrieved when lost. The apprehension of grievability precedes and makes possible the apprehension of precarious life. It may be argued that a life testified to or for when mourned and grieved is a ritual for the privileged that is not per se shared across cultures. But perhaps more crucially, Butler introduces the notion of precarious life. A precarious life, a precarious life sorry, is synonymous to vulnerability, she tells us. And as such is, com is, a com is the common denominator common, sorry, denominator to all grievable life. It is uncertainty, vulnerability, and dependency on the care of others that defines lives in the first place. However, precarity, a condition resulting from war, social unrest, climate change, or other causes, however, <clears throat> makes a life more dependent on the care of all of us, be it the state or pr private help. Precarity and therefore grievability is unequally distributed in geopolitical terms. Judith Butler's notion that grievability is the presupposition for a life that matters has taken prominence in refugee studies and international theory as a way <clears throat> to understanding why some lives count as less human or simply waste. Yet Butler's ethical turn has also encountered severe criticism some have talked about the Hamletization of politics, like Hoenig, with an, um, um, with an avenger who has become reflective, melancholic, and incapable of action, he, he argues. She argues, others such as Laclau and Mouffe have qualified Butler's position as a melancholic stance and exposed, as su and exposed it as such, as being a retreat from politics. Ida Danavid, with whom we, I think was discussed earlier uh, today and yesterday again, um, also argued that grief, compassion, and identification with the migrants as the basis of a new form of activism and cosmopolitanism maintains a post-colonial status quo in which the Western world maintains a position of moral superiority over its former colonies. The latter remain locked up in the role of victim and it perpetuates dependency towards a Western world comforted in its role as a dispenser of humanitarian help. She further argues that in the case of the recent work done on the Black Mediterranean, the ethical turn dehistoricizes the migrant crisis and turns away from the complexities of historical and cultural interlocking. This is all the more surprising since Butler's concept of grievability rests precisely on a need to and call for a cultural and public mourning that would seek to reflect on the historical context to US and the country's possible indirect responsibility or direct perhaps even responsibility in the 9-11 attacks um, where and which we had become the questioning of which had become a taboo, even if in, in the left wing lend or in the democratic lending newspapers such as the New York Times at, it, after, the, after the attacks. So I would like to underpin my proposition by retracing the argumentation Butler sets out in Precarious Life, um, and which explicitly sees, uh, which she explicitly sees as a prequel to frame, frames of work. Um, so, um, published, as I say, I, as I explained, it was published in 2004 in the wake of the politics of violence carried out by the Bush administration as a response to 9-11, in particular the Patriot Act, a series of laws that allowed to restrict civil rights, and then of course the Iraq, the Iraq, the Iraq war. In the chapter, Violence Mourning Politics, she reflects on how public mourning of the 9-11 period was rushed through with President Bush declaring on the 21st of September, only 10 days after the events, that grieving was over and time had come for so-called resolute action. It is in this context that Butler enlists Freud's classic study on mourning and melancholia in which he opposes normal mourning to melancholy, a form of pathological mourning. 
Normal mourning is a time-bound exercise. It seeks to understand what is mourned in the person we've lost or grieved for. It seeks closure in that understanding, which then supposedly would allow us to move forward and replace the lost object. Melancholia, by contrast, is unable to find closure. Um, it refuses to readily settle for an answer to the enigma of that, that grief pauses. Um, as Butler reminds, and she's therefore led to ask, what is it to be gained both on a personal and political level from repudiating grief and mourning as the Bush administration did? Um, if mourning is about understanding who one is in relation to those we've lost and what has been lost in those lives, then mourning is a process of self-understanding whether we see it as narcissistic or not. It is the primary recognition that the subject and mourner is always dependent on others and vulnerable to losing them. Butler therefore continues to explain that the Bush administration's denial of grief and its rushing into a politics of violence is a form of melancholic refusal to understand and mourn through the political context that led to the 9-11 attack, attacks. And the rushing into violence into political violence, she furthermore construes as a refusal on the part of the administration to acknowledge, to acknowledge its own vulnerability when precisely the country had for the first time of its history been attacked on its own territory. One thing I should um, add here and which may be helpful in understanding what happened there is that um, Freud also foregrounded ambivalence uh, towards the lost object in his um, famous essay on mourning and melancholia. So again, um, if one is unable to conceive oneself without an idealized other and therefore turns his ambivalence on oneself, leaving the subject depleted, divided and guilt-ridden. This may again, I would say, help explain what Butler identified as the Bush administration's or how the Bush administration banned any attempt to think of the 9-11 attacks in the context, let alone uh, um, in, in, as a consequence of the US neo-colonial politics. So sorry for this long, perhaps slightly too long um, prefer, preliminary remarks on, on Butler's work, but I wanted to show how this, in what historical context she, she wrote it. So this brings me to my next point, the representation of the bare lives and deaths in refugee camps. That, um, that what, sorry, <laughs> let me say this again. Um, so um, this brings me to my next point, the representation of the bare lives and deaths in refugee camps. That what forms the barely hidden face of neo-colonial and neoliberal forces. For that, I would like to focus on Ai Weiwei's film, Human Flow, which stands alone as a film, but which I propose to read together with his public art installations, the life vest from um, Safe Passage and his restaging of Alan Kurdi's lifeless body on a Turkish shore. Um, so, okay. As I mentioned, um, 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 I've lost my. As I mentioned, Iowa Way's human flow has been acclaimed for its ambition scale, um, but on the other hand, it attracted criticism along the lines of the opposition drawn by Butler between the massive numbers of ungrievable lives. Um, of the obvious titular uh, human flow, and on the other hand, those lives that are not grievable. Indeed, the film individualizes almost exclusively those who have political citizenship and social status. That is the doctors, the humanitarian workers and policy makers. So I've, you can see here, I mean, I've taken a few stills where you have these disindividualized lives of the, the that is that are problematic that problematically represents the refugees and the migrants by contrast the, the migrants are mostly represented as i said in anonymous groups long lines of peoples as i mentioned before um so my aim here is to possibly challenge this the, the, this criticism 
um, uh, by looking at the self-reflexive elements in Ai Weiwei's work. Self-reflexivity, I would say, cuts two ways. It can be seen as self-serving, but also as a means to ask an easy question. One of the obsessive questions I think that uh, Ai Weiwei forces upon us is um, to what degree we as onlookers uh, can identify with and to what extent the viral circulation of violent images is indeed constantly calling upon our empathy, empathy. But that affective identification begs the question of its moral purpose when it is not followed by action or activism. This is perhaps what is most obviously at stake in his ambivalent and provocative act of restaging Alan Purdy's life, um, a dead body. Um, so that's, that, that's the image we have here. Um, and um, what this image is probing, I would perhaps say or propose, is the authenticity of our empathy or to what end or action we use it. Likewise, the celebrity selfies taken at um, this that, that we talked about today, which we, we touched upon two days ago, um, which um, where um, uh, Ai Weiwei marshaled his guests to publish selfies of themselves wrapped in gold thermal blankets. Um, again, probes the same kind of question. The picture is even more problematic because of the promptness with which um, the guests executed himself, them, themselves or and complied with his demands, but also betrays their malleability and artist collusions with them. So it is, again, a way of st staging, I would say, the divide between an unshareable suffering of the migrants and a private and the privileged gala goers. Um, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so the question of identification with migrants is, I believe, <coughs> compellingly treated as the film constantly scales in and scales, scales in and out and zooms in and out of the grittiness and utter destitution of the migrants' lives, the camps. And um, so the way he uses parataxis, so that by that I'm constantly, he, the, the way the, the, the camera constantly shifts from distant shots of anonymized groups to close ups of children or migrants um, back again to very long and distant aerial shots that we've seen on the first picture, which give a sense of abstract, almost um, distant, you know, shoot the problem as a globalized um, planetary issue, I would say. Um, again, here, I think underlying the, the 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 helpless the sense of helplessness uh, of Ai Weiwei again set against this grander and anonymous narrative there are rare occasional cameos of individual <laughs> um, lives and deaths um, that stand out more poignantly um, on the one so um, there is of course twelve minutes in twelve minutes already into the film. In the, into the documentary, we are shown a floating orange jacket drifting on its own as a metonymy of an absent body with no name, um, with no name, an understatement for a lonely death and a life lost to the sea that can hardly be mourned. On another occasion, YY provides a short narrative that features a mi migrant named um, Ismatola Sediki who tells how he lost his wife and children who drowned in the sea. By way of a bitry, he can only say their names and by way of relics, he possesses only no more than their identity cards. This perhaps is the utter existential and subjective destitution of the migrant being stripped of his right and capacity to mourn. So that's my last image um, and no, no time to show the film here. 
Um, so in conclusion, I would like to return to the initial question that I formulated in my introduction. What is it that we grieve for, for when we see the images of migrants that have gone viral, have been duplicated, commented upon, appropriated with pathos or irony at the risk of either becoming fossilized, fetishized or emptily formulaic? One answer may be political, and embedded already in the news in the film Human Flow, when um, Ai Weiwei shows how the Calais jungle is being dis destroyed, and at the same time he sh he doubles that image with um, a, a, a newspaper title: "Europe is dead, long live Europe," which he takes has taken from Der Spiegel. As the jungle is progressively being raised. An extract from the Charter of the Fundamental Rights of the European Union is then also superposed on that shot. The Union is founded on the indivisible universal values of human dignity, freedom, equality and solidarity. It is based on the principles of democracy and the rule of law. Ai Weiwei's telescoping of the destruction of the Calais jungle and the EU lofties but failed ambition is of course painfully ironic freedom, equality, and solidarity, once the bedrock of European values have now become deadlock. There is, of course, much more to it, but as Butler suggested in Precarious Life, lives not mourned personally, culturally, and politically. Um, if, sorry, lives are not mourned personally, culturally, and politi politically, there is always the risk of falling into a sterile melancholy that leaves the onlooker incapable of acting or a melancholy gone astray that takes the form of violence and war. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I guess it's quite fitting that the last uh, talk was also about uh, uh, Iowa Way's art, which uh, it illustrates our program. Um, I, I have a question actually. As, as the next keynote is online, where else is this? Okay, so so we can have questions. Uh, <laughs> serious, actually, for us. <laughs> uh, questions. You all. Sonia is very interesting to phrase migrants as often more as one race of migrants in the moment. But because it's a story of getting more into a very own story, which repeats my mind Macedon and others, but um, how do you design to choose a figure of setting good and positive of the problem of How do you design it's totally complicated because it's the same for a way? And for Nada, um, uh, for in my experience, the cost of papers <laughs> is more with the living than with the dead. Uh, mm. No experience, <laughs> uh, and uh, in the start of time, it's, there is no this sort of problem with the dead. First, there is with the dead, with the miser, which is why in Italy, which doesn't want to be living in person. So, this is a man who let them go, and the French then with the miser. And the uh, car go to Italy. <laughs> so there is a, but in this case, I don't understand, I, I, I don't know, I wonder why there is so different attitudes in France in the same country, in the same place. And why, how can you explain it? Because what I have seen is that the couple and the legalist in this country had to bury the persons. Who are died on the 